you that are here tonight. And I know the Lord is here in a mighty way. We appreciate his presence so much. And thank you, Rick, for that uh, Holy Spirit groundwork you did. You really had no way of knowing what the Lord gave me tonight. And it uh, goes right along with that. We're going to redeem the time. We have a lot of friends in the audience, but I won't take time to recognize anyone because I'll overlook someone. And we want to get right into this. We're going for double. I know it's a gambler's analogy, but when I learned that you can just shoot for the whole pot, whatever that means, that's what I want to do. I, did, I, I know it's a gambler's analogy, I'm told, but I want to go for double. I want to go for broke. I don't know what uh, this means to you, but I want to lay it all on the line. All of it. I got nothing to lose, really. So much to gain. Second Kings, chapter 13. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 13, uh, verse 14 beginning. I'm reading from the New King James Version. I usually always read from the Old King James Version. John Limber gave me a very expensive New King James Version, so I'm getting used to that. And uh, besides, I gave my expensive Old King James away to a lady that uh, qualified for it. I was uptight one night and she came up and she just happened to be the last one to ask me, do you have a word from the Lord for me? And I said, uh, <laughs> took it as long as I could and I said, yes, lady, here's a whole book full of them. Just take them home and help yourself. There's 7,000 promises. And she didn't know that that was divine sarcasm. She accepted it as a great compliment and also took my $80 Bible <laughs> home with her. So I'm not going to do that tonight. I'll give you a word if you need it, but uh, if the Lord gives it to me first. Second Kings 13, 14, and here it is. Elisha had become sick with the illness which he would die. And then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Maybe that doesn't mean to you what it means to some of us, but when my great predecessor, the apostle Paul of old, said, You have 10,000 instructors, but not many fathers. The last thing God is going to do is fulfill Malachi 4.6. He's going to send the spirit of the Father, the spirit of Elijah. I'm not looking for another Elijah, but we could sure use that Father spirit. And that was passed on to Elisha in a double portion manner as Rick brought that out tonight. So here, the last of the great fathers is dying. The king is saying, my father, oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen. And Elisha said to him, take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hands on it on the king's hands. I want you to notice how obedient the king is here, to a point. And Elisha said, open the east window. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till they have been destroyed. Then he said, take the arrows, so he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground, so he struck three times and stopped. I tell you, the pride of man and the fear of man is deadly, and uh, this is in that Saul regime that Rick was talking about tonight. The fear of man is deadly. Uh, uh, Saul's one cop-out was, I was afraid of the people, and if you're not afraid of anyone tonight, you have just become 
a deadly weapon against the powers of darkness and against the devil and all of hell. You might even become a dreaded champion, as Bob Jones calls it. Uh, the Lord appeared to Bob and gave him a vision. I think he was in a trance, rather. And the Lord told him he was about to release his dread, uh, dreaded champions. And I believe that uh, for every sevenfold attack of the devil, for every complete attack that's against the church today, and there is that sevenfold complete attack, God is raising up enough dread champions, dreaded champions against the devil to cause the devil to really tremble. And uh, we have a couple of his warlocks here tonight. But I apologize to you. You don't know what you're getting mixed up in, and you're just getting lost in the crowd. You're just like two little snakes hissing and missing, and you're not making any headway at all. So God uh, have mercy on you. A universalist came to me a while back, and he said, don't you believe that eventually even the devil will be saved? And I said, oh, no, I don't believe that at all. But it's very interesting. He's been attending every one of our meetings lately, and he just might answer the invitation. <clears throat> but of course, I don't believe that. But um, I don't know when the New Agers and the Spiritualists that they have joined forces with will learn that greater is he that is in God's people when they stop all the rivalry and all the nonsense and get on the right side of obedience and do everything according to the will of God and according to the revelation of God. When, I, when the church, the fearful church, gets into full swing, you see, the church is not feared tonight, only mocked, but God has a number for in preparation at a cave somewhere. Maybe it's a cave in Kansas City, maybe it's a cave in Santa Ana, or a cave in Anaheim, or a cave in Denver, or a cave in San Diego, or a cave somewhere, but he's got caves all over the place, and he's developing cave men and cave people like David. They're, in the, they're under a certain anointing all the time. They're in the cave. But look out, God's dreaded champions, while old Saul is still anointed and while old Saul is still reigning, God has some obedient people that have separated themselves from the world of flesh and the devil. And they're going to come out with great power and great anointing and great instruction and divine w wisdom and divine information, and they're going to bring God's army together. But anyway, I find it very exciting to think of the divine possibility and the potential here in 2 Kings 13, 18. Elisha said, Take the arrows. So he took them, and he uh, said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground. So he struck three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times. I don't know how many references I've found with, um, with the help of Mike Bickle that relate to this very thing. You should have, and I would have, you should believe on the glory, or you should rather believe, it said I know that if you would believe, if you would, you would receive, and you would see the glory of God. And so we have that all through the word. But anyway, Elisha is saying, you should have struck five or six times. Now six would have been going for double, and six would have been uh, the double amount. But I asked the Lord, why did he uh, let him say, let Elisha say, if you had only struck five times, uh, you would have gotten the same result. And I don't want to get hung up on numbers or anything, but you know, five represents the number of grace, six the number of man, but we're not getting into that part of it. I believe that would be applicable here with the five times. God was willing to allow the enemy to be destroyed and the enemy to be held back. And remember that those Syrians were just as wicked as Nazi Germany. They were as much a threat. They posed as much a threat to uh, the children of Israel as Nazi Germany uh, posed to the uh, children of Israel, I mean to the Jews. So Elisha said, had you done it five times or six, they would have, then you would have struck Syria until uh, uh, you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Oh, we must. Be very careful, and I mean we must be very careful what we hear because God is holding us accountable. Please turn to Mark 4, verse 24. Mark 4, verse 24. I'm preaching a message to you in a minute, a few minutes, entitled The Jealousy of God. And I want you to be very careful when you hear it. It is a prophetic message, 
Brother Leonard Ravenhill this morning, I believe by revelation, told you that I would be preaching this tonight. He had no way of knowing that in the natural. And God uh, has been uh, indelibly engraving this message on my heart from day to day, and especially for this conference or this whatever this thing is called, this gathering. So, <laughs> um, but it, it would be applicable tonight and very appropriate for me to read Mark 4, 24 as a warning from the Lord. And here it is. And Jesus said to them, Take heed, the old King James says, Be very careful. Be very careful what you hear. Jesus says fifteen times, He that hath an ear to hear, or he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He only alluded to tithing once in all the New Testament, and then uh, that most important subject was uh, wrapped up and done away with as far as the Lord was concerned. He just said, this you ought to do. I mean, there's some doctrines that are just um, uh, there. I mean, like the Trinity. I mean, it's uh, the, the most obvious thing in the world. But anyway, he said 15 times, he that hath ears to hear, or he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. So we do need to hear more and speak less. But I'm speaking tonight, so I am speaking because I've heard more <laughs> lately than I've been hearing. God would speak to every one of you, but he has a problem with you. He knows whether or not you have the intent to obey when he speaks. So he's a God of economy, and he's a practical God in that sense, so he doesn't bother to speak to you if you don't intend to obey. But if you have purposed in your heart to hear God to do business with heaven during this meeting, then God will begin to speak to you, and his word will come alive. And you must be very careful what you hear and not misinterpret or confuse what he says to you, because it can be very dangerous. It wasn't as dangerous before when you were tiptoeing through the tulips, and you were charismata, charismatic type of people, and you belong to the hallelujah, what's it to you club? But it's very serious in these last days. It's an end time brothers and sisters, and we're living in the closing time. God has all the time in the world to do what he has to do, but we don't have all the time in the world. The days are swiftly closing for you and me tonight, and we have just enough time to seek his face and not his hand. We have just enough time to sit before him and empty ourselves of all vain traditions and disavow our own knowledge and disclaim our own wisdom and come before him saying, Lord Jesus, I want to hear your voice. I want to obey your voice. I love you, and lovers seek each other's face. I'm seeking your face and not your hand, and I could care less what you open your hand and give me. I just want your face to be before me, and I want to inquire of you, as Rick said tonight, like David said, I want to inquire uh, of the sanctuary and of your sanctuary. I want to inquire of you. So let's be very careful. That's the warning. Be very careful what you hear for the same measure you use. It will be measured to you and to you who hear more, or rather to you hear, rather, you that hear, more will be given. Heavenly Father, help us to go for the double tonight and help us to hear twice as much as we've ever heard. Help us not to fear man and be shamed. Oh, dear God, let us forget everything but the purpose and the plan and our association with the Son of Man and with the Son of God tonight you're most concerned with. And Father, give us your Spirit. Let us see that in these last days it is the Father's Spirit that will come and turn the hearts of the children back to their parents and vice versa, and verse vice. Let us see that tonight and raise up. Father, show us some way to impart this. Let the Holy Ghost come in here unannounced for some unknown reason, and suddenly, as he did on the day of Pentecost, baptize our brains and impart to our hearts and our spirits something that goes beyond the soulish nature and something that divides asunder soul and spirit and deeply engrave on the tables of our heart the revelation of the Father. We'll give you the praise for it. I want to preface the next scripture reading is found in Numbers 25 with this. You can turn to Numbers 25, and we'll pick up with verse 1 in a minute. But the Lord revealed to me that we have had uh, three divisions. We've had the outer court. We've had the holy place. 
the inner court, and then we have yet to enter the Holy of Holies. And he also revealed that in the outer court we enjoyed the beholding and becoming principle, we in the 